Okay. I've right. heard if you don't, you turn out green on the shirt. So I know yeah, you know what blue you're doing. or green. Well, with okay. him, it's going to be shaky and blue anyway. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, there seems to be an awful lot of confusion about what's acceptable and what's not and what's going to work, what isn't. Um, how do you feel about everything so far? Well, uh, from my research, pretty limited, these chemicals do have public health hazards associated with them. Many are known carcinogens and known neurotoxicants. So it's not clear to me that there's any safe level. And we ought to be urging a precautionary principle of not letting any of that stuff be dumped into our water and our air unless we know they're safe. And I've heard that repeated in these committee meetings. So that should be our standard. But in the absence of that, uh, if, the, if I, I do have some confidence that our Department of Health and Human Services can come up with a good standard for us to rely on for now, but we do need stronger measures to protect our water quality and our air quality in our state, and we need to be funding our agencies to do their job. But you get in the sense that they, they may have been putting more of this through the air than through the water? I, I don't get that sense at all. I just think that was just a product of either the manufacturer or, or the um, the disposal of the chemical. I don't think that it was deliberately being uh, emitted in the air, but there is there is that element of it, and it's resulting in groundwater contamination near the plant because of the atmospheric deposition. The filtration systems that they are volunteering to give to folks, um, that should not serve as a as the solution. No, I just think that's temporary, and I, honestly, I think the solution is to make sure we don't put anything in our water that we don't know is absolutely safe. And there are so many chemicals out there that we're ingesting on a daily basis, not even just through our water and our air, but in our food and our food packaging. And um, there's a, it's a big problem, and, and EPA is unable to handle it right now, especially given the proposed Trump cut. So we need, as a state, it's incumbent on us to do a good job to protect our citizens. And you know, one thing that I don't hear anybody talking mm -hmm. about is the solvency of this company is required to keep all of this going. Well, there's that. And, you know, there's been... With the Dow DuPont merger, you know, Camores was put over to take all the liabilities and to, and to fail. Is there any fear? Well, about I, that? I think that's a problem. I think that was pretty deliberate to um, send Camores off on its own with all this outstanding liability with these perfluorinated compounds. And um, I'm not sure what recourse we're going to have on that, but it is a problem. So we ought to get this situated right away. And I, th I think a lot of us are frustrated with the sentence and transigence to move on this, but the House seems to be pretty deliberate about doing something. So there's some, yeah, so there's some fears that you have that there's going to be money down the road coming out of corporate pockets. I believe so, because um, just from the presentation from the Cape Fear utility, uh, how much money it's costing them to clean the water for their customers, it's, uh, that should not be on the rate payer, for sure. Does that help? Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, sure. There's something called low and high resolution, ultra high resolution. What does that mean? Um, mass accuracy, the work that I do in my lab, I use a very, very expensive piece of equipment that not everybody has access to to do the work that I do. I'm going to explain what high accuracy is. What is liquid and gas chromatography? Some things are amenable to GC or gas chromatography work, some things are amenable to LC work. I'll explain why that is. The work that I do in my lab is both targeted, meaning I go out and I look for a particular chemical, and non-targeted, where we go out and look to see what chemicals are in a sample. Those are two very different things. And then questions I didn't answer. Hopefully you won't have many of those. So to give you a little flashback, what is a mass spectrometer and what does it do? Every one of us are exposed to chemicals on a daily basis, whether it be through the things we eat and drink, the products we use, the drugs we take if we get sick. Here's an example of a chemical you take if you ever have inflammation. This chemical is made up of elements, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. A mass spectrometer measures the molecular weight of a chemical, okay? It doesn't measure the structure of a chemical. So part of my job when I find a chemical in water or soil or urine or air is to figure out what it is. I, the first piece of evidence I have is how much does it weigh? Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen have a known weight. And when you put them together mathematically, you come up with a number. It's a, it's a mass. It's actually a mass to charge. So a mass spectrometer, in essence, in true essence, is it measures a molecular weight. How does it get there, and what do we do with that information? The other thing about a molecule is we don't know how it's put together when we have a mass spec. We know it's compiled of all these elements, but those elements can be put together in many different ways. And that's part of my job, is to figure that out. There are lots of different mass specs. And the best explanation I could give is cars. We all own a car. Some of us have not such good cars, and some of us have really nice cars. So, the top one is what's called a triple quad or an MSMS. -MS. So these are the same exact thing, and I call this the Chevy. I'm a Chevy owner, a very old Chevy that I'm working on continuously. 
It's low resolution. This is the basic building block mass spec almost every lab in the country or in the world would have to do this kind of work. It does something called nominal mass. Nominal mass means it's only measuring for the molecular weight of a compound or a chemical to the first decimal place. It's not high resolution. It's inexpensive and common. When I say inexpensive, we're in the $250,000 range. I know that doesn't sound inexpensive, but relative to what you can spend, it is. The next one is what's called the time of flight mass spec. This is called high resolution. Okay, the Cadillac, if you will. If you're like a Cadillac is better than a Chevy, let's agree that's true. High resolution allows you to not only measure the molecular weight of that molecule, it can measure that molecular weight to the fourth decimal place. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it gives you a lot of uh, latitude to try to predict what a formula is if you can do that. And so that's what I do in my lab. It is, of course, more expensive. You get what you pay for, and it is becoming more common. I have two of these in my lab. These are the com uh, common instruments that are beginning to crop up in many environmental labs. In pharma, this has been decades. It's only getting now to be commonplace in environmental. And the last one, I, I thought of what's a better car than a Chevy, a Tesla. I want a Tesla, you probably want a Tesla. Ultra high resolution, okay? This is a mass spec that is not common. It's significantly more expensive. Can it do more than the other two? Absolutely, but not everybody has these. I have one of these. Lee Ferguson at Duke University, you may have heard his name, has one of these. There are some of these out there also at NC State, not this particular one. It's exact mass and it does something called fine isotope structure. And I won't put you to sleep other than to tell you this instrument is among the best you can possibly buy in the world to do high resolution work, mass spectrometry. I had just got this probably about two months ago and we're using this actively to do something called structure elucidation. When you find a chemical, and you don't know what it is, this instrument helps us figure out what it is. It's about $850,000. So this is at the high end. There are more expensive pieces of equipment. So the main difference between these three pieces of equipment I spoke of is resolution. So this is the ability to measure on a mass spec the differentiation of detected ions. What does that mean? A chemical has a known molecular weight. If there's something very similar to it in molecular weight, you cannot tease those apart from each other on a triple quad. It's just impossible. As you move up the scale of resolution, here you can see at the bottom it's 500 and at the top it's 20,000. Each time you move up in resolution, you can tease those molecules apart and you can tell this compound from that compound based on that resolution. Much like in your house, you can have a scale you step on to weigh yourself at the bathroom or you can weigh in your kitchen using that very small scale. They both do the same job. They weigh mass but they do it very differently. Mass specs are like that. They all do the same job, but they can't all do the exact same job. So, mass accuracy, when we talk about high resolution mass spectrometry, again, it's the ability to measure a molecular weight to the highest degree to the fourth decimal place. And the reason that's important is I told you a molecule is made up of elements. When those elements come together, carbon weighs 12, hydrogen weighs one, it doesn't really weigh one. Right, it weighs 1.00784. So when you put molecules together, the higher degree you can measure the accuracy of that mass, the lower the probability of other combinations of elements can make up a molecule. This is critical when it comes to mass accuracy and high resolution mass spec. The Orbitrap does it the best, a triple quad does it the worst. So ions are actually what you measure with a mass spec. Any chemical that goes into a mass spec is not measured unless it's charged. Okay? That molecule has to be either positively charged or negatively charged. It flies down this quadrupole, which is alternating positive and negative charges. The ion makes it to a detector at the end. Every mass spec does it the same way. The question is, what is it you're detecting at the end? In a triple quad, as the name implies, there are three quads. There's the first quad, which isolates the chemical of interest. There's the second quad where you have fragmentation of that chemical so it breaks apart. And there's the third quad where you isolate the things it turns into, all of this being sent to the detector. All the magics happen at the source. So those molecules need to be charged in order to fly down the quad. Neutral species get washed out. There are positive or negative charges. And most of us rely upon that loss of a hydrogen or gaining of a hydrogen. So here's in actuality what happens. Here's the compound PFOA. It weighs 413 AMU. 
When it goes into quad two, it breaks. This is much like you have a puzzle and you hit it and it breaks into pieces. Chemicals break into pieces. Those are sometimes called parents and daughters, okay? When it breaks into that piece, it's very unique. It's very specific. The ratio of those two fragments is very critical to the identification of a molecule. In a triple quad, again, this is the base information that we get for most of the targeted work we do. If you come to me and say how much Gen X is in the water, I go out and I purchase a Gen X standard, I run it in my triple quad, I make a method, and I can tell you how much is present. I need a standard to do that. That targeted analysis, again, relies upon the parent going to one or two, sometimes three daughters. And again, that ratio is critical. High resolution equipment, such as a time of flight mass spec, you may have heard, or a QTOF, which is a quadrupole time of flight mass spec, again, does the same thing. You measure the molecular weight of PFOA, it actually weighs 412, 9664. And when it fragments, it gives the 368, 9766. Right? It's essentially 412 and 369, but we measure to a high degree of accuracy what that fragment is and what that parent is. Again, it's a quadrupole, so we're breaking that molecule up and we're detecting the fragments. This is used for targeted analysis. You can buy a standard. It's also used for non-targeted analysis. And what that means is you come to me and give me a water sample and you ask me what is in that sample. That is not the same question as how much Gen X is in that sample. Those are two different questions. You can do both with this piece of equipment. You can measure for Gen X in that sample and you can measure for what is in that sample. And if you have questions about that later, I can go into it. But that's what this mass spec allows you to do. The other thing that's really critical about this, post-analysis data mining. When you run a sample on a triple quad and you monitor for 15 or 20 compounds, that is all you ever see with that mass spec. When you do high resolution mass spectrometry, you are monitoring from the time you start until the time you end all the masses that can be ionized and in going into that mass spec. You can go back again and again and again and you can mine that data to look for what was in that sample that you didn't think about last week, a year ago, two years ago. I answered a question yesterday from Larry Cahoon at UNCW and Detlef Kanapi at NC State who asked me the question, was this compound in the Cape Fear River going back in the summer? And the answer I could give them is yes, it was there because I could go back and mine that data. Instead of taking a sample and putting it in a freezer, you put your data in data storage and you can go back. High resolution mass spectrometry allows you to do that. And the last piece of equipment, I mentioned this Orbi trap. I won't bore you with the details as to why this is so much better. From a mass spec perspective, I would put you all to sleep. The real answer is that this instrument allows me to go in and tell with a high degree of certainty exactly what that formula is. With a high resolution mass spec, there is still some uncertainty. You're still a chemist, you still have to look at the literature, you still have to go into SciFinder and try to make an educated guess as to what you think it is. When you fragment it, what pieces you get. High resolution mass spectrometry or ultra high resolution helps me figure out whether that peak is from a sulfur 34 or two carbon 13s. I'll stop with that and tell you it's much more uh, impressive and it's much more costly, uh, but it is absolutely the way mass spectrometry is going. I have one, Lee Ferguson has one at Duke. So, liquid chromatography and gas chromatography. People sometimes ask the question, why are these two different techniques used? In a nutshell, when you get a sample and you run it on a mass spec, you don't want all the chemicals to go into the mass spec at the same time, okay? Those compounds that are ionized make it into the mass spec. You want to separate them. So in this example, we have a mixture. We all know that the Cape Fear River has lots of chemicals, tens, hundreds, thousands, let's say. If they all made it to the mass spec at once, that's not what you want. You want to separate them. So chromatography, color separation is what that means, is allowing these three colors, the green, the red, and the blue, that are originally all together to come apart as they move through the system. And what we do in liquid chromatography, we usually have the sample in something like methanol, methanol water. As they go through the system, that mixture separates out, so one compound at a time theoretically hits the detector, you resolve them chromatographically, and then the mass spec does additional work to resolve compounds that elute at the same time sometimes. Gas chromatography is no different. Instead of using liquid, you use helium and you use heat. So you separate here based on liquid chromatography using methanol and water. With gas chromatography, you apply heat in an oven, 
Volatile compounds go through quickly, less volatile compounds go through more slowly, and they come out one at a time. The concept is the same. The mixture turns into individuals. The mass spec detects them all. <clears throat> Gas chromatography is used for more volatile compounds, nonpolar chemicals, and things that are uh, water insoluble, I'm sorry, that should say, rather than water soluble on the right, such as benzene formaldehyde and HFPO, hexafluoropropylene oxide. This is something we know is being emitted at the Comores plant uh, in Fayetteville. Liquid chromatography, on the other hand, is used for non-volatile chemicals, polar chemicals, water-soluble chemicals, such as PFOA, Gen X, Nafion, for instance. These are complementary techniques. We should never do one and not the other, right? There are volatile compounds, there are non-volatile compounds. Much like a carpenter doesn't show up to your home to do your kitchen over with just a hammer, you'd probably fire him and kick him out. He's got to have a collection of tools. GC and LC is two different collections of tools that do different jobs, but they're both needed, and this is where they're needed. So for the work we did this summer in concert with NCDEQ, um, throughout the summer and fall, we did both targeted work on our triple quad, where we measured for concentrations of Gen X and some, we call them legacy perfluorinated chemicals, PFOS, PFOA, PFBS, PFHXS. We've known about these for a decade or more. We've got developed methods in our lab and other labs. So we were able to buy a standard for Gen X. You require a standard to do targeted work. If you cannot get a standard, you cannot do that kind of work. Once you have that standard, the triple quad is the way to go. It's sensitive, it's robust, everyone has one. The non-targeted analysis is what you have to do if you do not have a standard. If you do not have a standard and you need to predict a formula for an unknown, if you need to go in and do some discovery as to what's in that sample, you require high resolution. Nafion 1 and 2, these three other compounds on the bottom, and others, I would say, other previously undescribed analytes, are found and have been found in those samples and will continue to be found. I noticed one of the representatives asked a question earlier about, you know, the light right now is shining on Gen X in the Cape Fear River, but this is not a Cape Fear River alone issue. This is a water <coughs> issue. This is a water quality issue. These mass specs allow us to go in and look for what is there and figure out so we can do something about risk assessment, so we can do something about shutting down a source, so we can protect human health. We have to go and look for those things we don't yet know about. And I use my time of flight instrument to do that kind of work this summer. So hopefully I've answered some of those questions. If I didn't, I'm sure there will be additional questions. And if you need to contact me, uh, there's my number and my email address at the EPA. I'm glad to speak to you now or any time in the future. Are there any members of the committee that have any questions for Mr. Strong? Representative Dixon, you're recognized. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to say Mark because I can pronounce that. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation, very little of which I understood at all. But I'm uh, very confident that you understand it from one end to the other. Uh, in the beginning of your remark, you said that it was your research facility or your something that originally discovered Gen X in the Cape Fear. Is that correct? That's correct. Help me understand what stimulated you. What was the cause of action? Why did you come and test the water in the Cape Fear? Okay. So the reason we did that was there was an agreement with my agency, the US EPA, with the eight major manufacturers in the United States that were making <coughs> PFOA, that they were being asked to no longer manufacture PFOA or the compounds that degrade to PFOA. So this would be called C8. And it was not known to the, the vast majority of the scientists in this community what was being switched to. These are highly useful compounds that are used in many different formulations, products, you know, your jacket, your pants, your carpeting. So we knew that the companies that manufacture these were going to be still making this class of compounds, but we didn't necessarily know what they would be making. And so we had done some earlier work in 2007, and we noted in the Fayetteville area there was an uptick in some of these legacy analytes. So um, as an analytical chemist, if you want to see a high signal, you usually go to an area where you have seen a high signal in the past. It happens to be downstream of Comores or DuPont. And we looked to see what did we already know that was in that sample, and what was in that sample we didn't know. And that's the, that was the impetus behind starting to do this research. Because it's not, 
It's not well known to the bench level analytical chemist what is in the river based on what's called the pre-manufacture notice. When a chemical company wants to make a new chemical, that's confidential business information within my own agency. I don't get access to that information, so I have to use mass spectrometry to figure it out. Follow up. Yes, sir. Was your facility or any of your folks, were you involved in any research work in the West Virginia area to where the same types of uh, conditions existed with uh, DuPont in that area? Yes, that's a good question. We do have some work that has been going on for about the last year and a half. Um, there is a Camores slash DuPont. For the, last, for the last year and a half? Year and a half or so. When, when did the West Virginia uh, story break? How many years ago? I would say it's better than five or six years ago for PFOA. It, it broke. And so you just got involved in it in the last year and a half? Yes. Yeah. What other areas other than West Virginia and the Cape Fear in uh, North Carolina have you so done testing in? We do work with any state or region that asks us to work with them. We are working with the state of New Jersey. We are working with the state of New Hampshire. We are working with Minnesota. We are working with Michigan. Um, perfluorinated compounds, like I said earlier, it's not unique to this state. They're very useful compounds. They're used globally, not just in the United States. And so these, um, these issues crop up again and again and again at multiple um, state entities and, and the DOD in, in, is another example with AFFF. So lots of activity with lots of different entities. Did follow up? Yes, sir. Did the West Virginia uh, uh, company uh, voluntarily uh, quit making the product? No, they did not. So here's, here's the way it works with Gen X, for instance. It is made in Fayetteville. It's a polymer processing aid that is shipped to West Virginia to make Teflon. So that compound, Gen X, alone is used to make Teflon. They make Teflon at the Comores facility in West Virginia. They manufacture the Gen X down in Fayetteville. So it's the same company doing two different product lines and sort of working together with each other. So up in West Virginia, um, the work that we've done most recently only sees Gen X in those samples. We don't see the mixture that we see here in West Virginia, I'm sorry, in uh, Fayetteville. Uh, follow up, uh, yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, for yes, uh, DEQ. Uh, yes, sir. Who at DEQ would you like to uh, pose a question to? My, my question is, was, were, was DEQ aware of the West Virginia situation when additional permits were issued either to Camores or DuPont in the federal area? Was the West Virginia situation a historical event when additional uh, upgrades or whatever to the permits that Camiris or DuPont uh, took place. I would ask, is there any staff from DEQ that is here that might be able to answer that question? Hi, Linda Culpepper, Interim Director of the Division of Water Resources. I apologize, uh, Representative Dixon, I was not with the water program at the time of t frame that you're talking about, but I think it's generally known that there were issues with West Virginia facility. We had talked with DuPont um, about their transition to new chemicals at that time. Thank you. Any follow-up? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that um, it would be understandable information for the committee to consider if, if we could understand the relationship timing-wise with the known conditions in West Virginia, which, if I'm not mistaken, ended with a very huge lucrative settlement, uh, and how that did or did not play into the decisions that were made in North Carolina. That would be helpful to me. I think that I know some of the answers. I think that I have a pretty good understanding but I would like clarification as we move forward to uh, help me understand how well we considered the known information from West Virginia and how that played into our decisions in North Carolina to either allow or not allow some of the same types of activities to take place 
as far as discharge is concerned. Representative Dixon, are you referring to clarification by DEQ? Yes, sir. I would like to know what they knew about West Virginia and when they knew it and how that played into their uh, uh, permitting process for Kimmel's and Federal. I think I already know the answer, but I would ask, is there anyone from DEQ staff that can shed any light on Representative Bruce, uh, Dixon's questions today? Um, again, this is Linda Culpepper. Um, I'm going to try to give a, a turn at this. Um, Representative Z Dixon, as um, Dr. Strinar has indicated, EPA does the pre-manufacturing notification. They do that review under TSCA. That TSCA program is not delegated to the state, so the state was not involved in the decision can this manufacturing happen or not in North Carolina. What we do have control over is on the NPDES permitting side. Um, our understanding was that the manufacturing of Gen X was done in a closed loop system, um, West Virginia and in North Carolina, that it did not have a water discharge from that manufacturing area. What we did not learn until June of, this, uh, of 2017 was that Gen X was a byproduct of another manufacturing line that had continued. That was new information to us in June of 2017. Follow up. Follow up. Did you verify in actuality that indeed it was a closed loop situation? Ms. Culpepper? Yes, sir. To the best of our ability at the time. Follow up. Follow up. Yes, sir. But that later proved to not be true. Is that correct? Ms. Culpepper? Sir, as I understand it, even to today, the manufacturing of Gen X is done in a closed loop system. I don't have any information to think otherwise. What we understand is Gen X is coming from, was coming from another manufacturing area. We have successfully um, worked with commuters to divert all wastewater from their manufacturing areas, so they're collecting it, storing it, and shipping it off-site for disposal so that none of the manufacturing wastewater at this time and since November 30th has entered into the Cape Fear River. Can I follow up? Yes, sir. But we, we still don't have an exact uh, handle on uh, what instances actually caused the spikes that we've talked about uh, today at the, you know, certain spikes, whether it was rainwater runoff or something nefarious on someone's part. We, 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 we can't yet explain those spikes. Is that correct? Ms. Culpepper? Yes, sir. We are. We are continuing to look at this to try to quantify is it coming from the stormwater discharge, come from the groundwater contamination, just as Cape Fear Public Utility had also uh, indicated as well. So we think there are multiple pathways that are, are putting our water at risk. Uh, Representative Mikhail Raff, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Doctor, for being here. Um, I just have a question about the uh, mass specs, the high resolution, um, and just to um, uh, I just wanted to let people know that my retirement comes from Thermo Fisher Scientific, which is the the Tesla version here. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to um, find out when we were given a quote for high resolution spec. Was it the Cadillac version for 550 or 500,000? Do you know or? I don't know if maybe Andy can answer that question. Would you recognize yourself for the record, please? Uh, Andy Miller, the Legislative Affairs Director for DQ. Uh, Representative Mikhail Raft, uh, we uh, asked the General Assembly, and I believe the House passed out with a unanimous vote, uh, $537,000 for us to have the QTOF, the quadrupole time of flight. And I only know that based on my conversations with Mr. Strynar and with Linda Culpepper. Uh, and I can get you the exact uh, specs on what we asked for. Uh, but it's my understanding that we asked for the QTOF to do the targeted and non-targeted analysis. So to answer your question, if it was a QTOF, yes, it would be the Cadillac. The Cadillac version. Um, so follow up, Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. I have a series of questions, if that's okay. That's fine. Far okay. away. Thank you. Um, where are you located? I am located in Research Triangle Park, just down the road from here. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I think I used to call on you guys. Um, anyway, um, can you tell me why you couldn't do this work for us rather than our doing this, since we're actually doing this for the United States of America and not just for North Carolina? 
So I will give you my answer. I don't represent the agency in this response is we have been doing this for the state of North Carolina since June and have been doing it, I think, to a high degree of satisfaction to the state and turning it around very quickly. We serve obviously many other states in this nation and it's at the discretion of those who I work for to make that decision whether or not we work solely with the state of North Carolina or we work with all the states and regions we represent. So continuing work with the state of North Carolina is absolutely, if it's up to me, it's been a wonderful experience. They're very professional and, and I'd love to continue to do it, but that's not my call. Is it Pruitt's call or Trump's call? <laughs> Am I being recorded? No. Well, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. In your professional opinion, should the state of North Carolina invest taxpayer money at 850 to get the Tesla version, or could we get the same results from the Cadillac version of the mass spec? So that's a great question. My opinion would be you do not need the Tesla to do the job. I've done this job for the state of North Carolina and the discovery using the Cadillac version. Can can you do more work with the Tesla version? Yes, you can, but you need a dedicated staff of more highly trained people. It's significantly more costly to buy that piece of equipment and it's not necessarily needed. So my answer would be with a QTOF, you'll absolutely be adequately uh, staffed, I'm sorry, uh, with equipment to do the job that I've been doing for you and others all along. One more question. I'm no, sorry. I'm sorry. You I, I don't mean for you to be on trial here I'm either. So, I'm used to but it. But I need your expertise. <laughs> um, the other states that you're doing work for, do they have their own mass spec or are they depending on you um, solely? Yeah. Almost every state we work with has their own mass spec. What they don't have is the technical expertise to do the work that we do. The reason we work closely with the state is when this cropped up, nobody else knew how to do this. We happen to be in the backyard of the Wilmington area. So we get called on regularly because we can do things that other labs cannot yet do. Because I develop methods, I have to show that it works and then I do technology transfer so others can start to do that and people are beginning to come up to speed on those things that we can do, but some are not yet there. So we still get called on because it's not available commercially, or we need to teach people how to do it is what we do. And, and that's slowly changing, but that's usually why we get that call, not because they don't have the equipment. Once we know they have the equipment and I can show you how to do what I do, I'd rather you do the work than I do the work, to be perfectly honest with you. Sorry. That's okay. One final question. Every time you tell me something, I have another question. Um, what is this a chemist that would need to be trained, or are these technicians that would need to be trained? Um, because you don't really have to have a PhD to work, run these machines, right? So, I mean, to interpret maybe, but not. I, I, this it's a little bit of a loaded question because I could give you an answer that goes in both directions. What you really need is a competent chemist that can take orders from somebody who knows how to do it, begin to do that work, demonstrate proficiency, and then ask lots of questions when they hit a wall. It doesn't need to be a PhD trained chemist. I work with grad students from Duke, UNC, and NC State regularly that are working on master's degrees, and they can do this job. They just have to be competent people that are good scientists, and that doesn't come with your degree or your years of experience it comes with you know what you have upstairs and I never answered your question from earlier so I don't know if you want to ask the question or did you want me to address it <laughs> okay no, you're in the queue but representative Harrison thank you mr. chair thank you for your presentation I believe my level of comprehension is probably around representative Dixon's um, or lower and my last chemistry class was high school, uh, which was decades and decades ago. So forgive my ignorance. Um, just to start out, I appreciate what you're doing to help us out with this problem. I'm a little bit concerned about the president's budget that proposes a 35% cut to the EPA. So I'm worried about your availability to help us to continue to deal with this problem if we don't do some of it in-house. I'm trying to understand um, how this works. 
the uh, the orbit trap that I believe that we had um, that the the house had passed the five hundred thirty seven thousand dollars to um, to purchase for our DEQ is that um, I, I guess I'm wondering is the orbit trap is it orbit trap fusion or is the orbit trap fusion different from orbit trap is the, are they the same in terms of capabilities so one clarification point it sounded to me like the quote was for a QTOF. So that was not for an Orbi trap. The Orbi trap is significantly more costly, and it's it's not exactly what was quoted. Um, however, I will tell you, Orbi traps like cars have lots of options. So you can buy the Tesla, but you can buy various kinds of Teslas within an Orbi trap. There's a Fusion, there's an HF, there's a Lumos, and and there's room to move in either direction. You pay for what you you know you get, um, but the Orbi is at the very top end. A few follow-ups, please, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, so, if I understand it correctly, what we're trying to do is identify compounds that are emerging that may have not been disclosed by the um, emitter, and um, you're able to do this with a level of sophistication that comes with these spectrometers. And the higher you go in terms of quality, the more you are able to detect. Is that right? It's, it's not necessarily the more you're able to detect. It's, it's can you, with a higher degree of certainty, tell the people you're working with and for, I believe it's this chemical. With an Orbi trap, you have a higher degree of certainty. With the high resolution mass spec, you have a high degree of certainty, but it's not as much as an Orbi trap. So you can do this job with a high degree of certainty, but you have to involve literature reviews, you have to involve bench level chemists that know about synthesis, you have to know when chemicals fragment what they turn into in the mass spec. So to answer your question maybe a little more forcefully, you can do this job with a QTOF, you don't need an Orbi trap to do this kind of work. And follow up. So you're able to identify chemicals that may have a public health concern but have not been identified just by using these machines and you feel confident that we would get the level of detection that we need from the Cadillac version versus the Orbit Trap Fusion? Yes, the answer is yes, because all of the work that I did for compound identification for these compounds in the Cape Fear River was done on a TOF. So it's a time of flight mass spec. It didn't have a quadrupole. So to not geek you out a little more, but without the quadrupole, you cannot isolate an analyte and fragment it. So all of the work that I did was on the tail end the cheaper end of the Cadillac. And I did a, just the fine job surrounding myself with good chemists and knowing what we can and can't do with that equipment. So yes, you could do it. And last follow up for now. I um, appreciate that we're focused on water quality here. I'm concerned about, particularly with perfluorinated compounds and with flame retardants, that we're exposed to that in a number of um, ways, including food packaging or clothing or as you're with the Teflon. So. Are you able to test those products, or is this, or is this just all water that we're talking about? It is not just water. Some of the chemicals you talked about I've worked on myself, the flame retardants. Um, those could be in house dust, those, those can be in products. They can be in soil, they can be in fish that are swimming in the river. Um, it's not just water. Uh, the mass spec doesn't care where it comes from. All the work up front to get that chemical out of whatever media you're working on once it gets to the mass spec, it's all treated the same. It's, there is some upfront work that's a little bit different, but it's not just water. You're welcome. Representative Yarborough, you're recognized for- Oh, God, uh, that's me. <laughs> uh, thank you, and I appreciate you uh, explaining a lot of this in more depth. It's been several weeks since I had organic chemistry. And, um, and the fact that, um, that people need to understand that you're not just putting, this, uh, putting a sample in the spectrometer and having a computer printout of what it is. There's a whole lot of, um, of science and a little bit of art that goes into, as you call it, determining the degree of certainty that what you've got. Um, and then we get into the, one of my pet peeves, significant digits. We've, um, we've gotten a number of, um, of results of Gen X levels, uh, uh, the table in front of me now shows uh, using the significant digits, it appears to be accurate to 10 parts per trillion. The table below it uh, claims an accuracy of one part per trillion. Uh, you started to talk about how you're pretty confident at the 150 parts per trillion level and less as you go. Can you go into more depth as to 
sure. what the certainty is at the lower levels? Okay. So I think there's two questions here that are not necessarily defined by significant digits. So the degree of certainty I'm talking about is, is it that chemical in the sample? That's one degree of certainty. High resolution mass spectrometry lets me know, I think it's this compound and here's why I think it is with some degree of certainty. You're talking about quantitation. When you give me a sample and you ask me how much Gen X is in that water, I have to run a calibration curve. Well, I put a known amount of that chemical into water, various known amounts, and I make a calibration curve from 1,000 down to 10. I think the question is, how well can I predict 10? Do I think it's 10, or is it 10 plus or minus a spread? And the answer is, at the bottom end of any calibration curve, any analytical chemist will tell you there is more spread in how confident you are that the number is 10. Usually, most people say plus or minus 30%. So between seven and 13 is the same thing as 10. As you move up your calibration curve and you get to the high end, we allow 20%, but in actuality, it's usually plus or minus 10% in most instances, and sometimes less than that. And that's because as these mass specs are being infused with these compounds and the signal is going up, less compound, less signal, more compound, more signal, you have less spread about how the, the, the mass spec responds. So at the high end, I can give you a high degree of certainty, and we do this through quality assurance and quality control, where we put known amounts of these chemicals in water, whether it's the water I took out of the river or it's a deionized sample from the lab, and I go and I predict from my calibration curve how much is in that sample, and it's usually blind to me. I ask somebody to put an unknown amount in, and I can tell you whether or not when it's then unblinded to me. If they put 500 in and I say it's 1,000, I did a really bad job. If I say it's 510, I did a pretty good job. And the, the actuality is at the high end, it's much easier to do. If we revolve around the low end of calibration curves, first of all, I, my opinion would be it's not meaningful. Concentrations down at the low end of the calibration curve that are that low um, are not where we need to kind of focus our efforts. If we have a health advisory of 140 nanograms per liter, I want to be darn sure that I'm able to measure 140. I don't care if it's one or two or three. Right? So if it's 5,000, you know, that's meaningful. So I hope I answered your question. There is, there is some degree of certainty difference between where you are on that curve, but at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, is it meaningful in that sample at that very low level? And parts per trillion is a low level. You know, as soon as you start talking about parts per trillion, but there are known health effects for PFOA, for example, that things around 40 to 70 nanograms per liter. That's what's been demonstrated. So it's not unheard of for these compounds at that level to cause an effect. Uh, actually, I brought up a follow-up. Um, mm -hmm. How hard is it to get a sample of Gen X to use in the laboratory to, as your reference? That was not hard at all. Um, as soon as I discovered what I believe the compound was, I found a comp corporation called Synquest that synthesized it. I was able to go out and buy it, put it on my mass spec, and demonstrate not only that it was the right chemical, but there's something called retention time. When those chemicals move through that LC system, they come out at a known time every time, again and again and again, with a little bit of wiggle. And as soon as I put that chemical in and I got the right retention time and the mass spec response was the same, it was confirmed. The problem is for the compounds we cannot buy standards for. We can never truly say this is exactly this compound and this is how much is there until we can get that standard and that's where we're at with some of these right now. But Gen X was pretty easy. Does that answer everything, Representative Yarborough? Yes. Okay, thank you. Chairman Grange, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Streiner, for being here today. I've learned more about spectrometers than I ever thought that I could. But my question has to do with um, how long would it take to stand up such a machine uh, with, and train the technicians or the analysts or whoever needs to, to get that thing operational? What would be the time frame? Would you be including purchasing it? Yes. Okay. So if you're anything like we are in the federal government, an amazing amount of time to get anything through to be purchased, I think six months to a year is where we function at the US EPA. From the time we say, okay, let's go get it till the time it's in-house. Once in-house, it's not that long to get it functional and to have a person who can do the job that I do, I would say on the order of a month or two 
Um, my job as a chemist at the EPA is to show people how to do what it is I do so that they can do it as well. So I think that that's the easier part. The actual purchasing and getting it through acquisitions is, is the biggest hurdle I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Mikhail Raft, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh. Um, since Duke has one of these, and we've had a presentation, I believe, from Dr. I don't know what his name is, I'm sorry. Lee Ferguson, probably. Yes. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think about paying Duke to do our samples? He's set up for it, um, you know, do a contract with them to do it. He's working with you very well. They already have trained personnel, grad students, et cetera. It would fit into his research project. I was just kind of thinking off the top of my head, you know, maybe that would be the option. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good question. We actually talked about this at lunchtime. Um, I think in the interim and the near term, it answers this question quite well. And could you do that? Yes, you could. He's well equipped, he has adequate staff, and he does a great job. The question is, six months down the road, a year from down the road, when something else crops up, are you still adequately able to do that by working with somebody that has a contract with you? And it might be yes. Um, the, the example I gave at lunchtime was I have a toaster and you have a toaster and I don't want to go to your house to make my toast in the morning. I want to make it in my house. And so if NCDEQ has that equipment, they're adequately supplied with equipment and people, they can do this job and they don't have to rely on shelling out money to a contract somewhere. And then they're also in line for what are the other things that person needs to do. So you know, that's my opinion on yes, you could do it, but I don't know in the long term if that's the best solution. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. That's okay. Is there um, a quota? Is there a question quota? No, a question okay. quota. Not, not for Representative McHale, Rapp. We waive that. <laughs> Thank kidding. you, Mr. Chair. I just, I'm sorry. I got to have all my information. No, they're, good, they're good questions. That's why um, we're here. C8, which was what they had in West Virginia, mm -hmm. that is a known carcinogen. How did it become a known carcinogen? Who decided that it was a carcinogen? Was that CDC so, with EPA? So first, I don't think it's a known carcinogen. I think it's a suspected carcinogen. And I'm not a toxicologist, and I don't do risk assessment, as I said earlier. I think the scientific advisory board, who is uh, hired by the US EPA to make determinations such as that, determined whether or not, based on the animal data they had seen and the human data at the time, if they warranted that PFOA or C8 was a human carcinogen, and to what degree. And there are known, suspected, I don't remember what the others are. Like I said, I'm not the toxicologist or risk assessor, but it's, it's people that the EPA has hired to look at that data and make that determination, the scientific advisory board. Follow up. Yes, ma'am. Um, is that scientific uh, board looking at C3 or Gen X now the same way they are doing C8? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. Chemically. Is C8 kin to C3? Chemically, I would say no. So okay. C8 are eight carbons are fully fluorinated. C3, three carbons are fluorinated. There's an oxygen linkage, and three carbons are fluorinated. Actually, two are fluorinated, and one is carboxylated. It's a polyfluorinated compound, so they're akin in that they're in that same class, but they're, uh, they're, not, um, they're not the same thing. Um, they're, I don't know, they're in the same family is maybe the best answer for that. Follow up one more time and then yes, I'm gonna shut up. Um, so what, what you're saying, I guess there's other things that are in that family too that we don't know or think are carcinogens. So mm -hmm. we have no idea right now if C3 or Gen X could possibly be a carcinogen. I, the, the short answer would be you're right. Um, we, cannot, we cannot answer that question until there's adequate toxicology data to say when you give it to a dose rodent, for example, for 28 days, what happens to that rodent until you know what that compound is, until you can purchase that compound, until you can do that study. Um, and Gen X is very new with respect to what we know. PFOA and PFOS, you know, those have been studied for quite some time. 
I'm really more troubled with the analytes that we can find that we have no toxicology data on because you can, you can make no assessment whatsoever about risk until you do something toxicologically. Whether or not there's data as to whether the Gen X is, is um, cancerous, I don't know. There was an assessment done by the Netherlands. There's a fairly good report. Um, there's a Comores facility in the Netherlands and they did an assessment of the ammonium form and the free acid form of Gen X. I don't know if, if everyone follows me on that and what literature was out there, including the company that makes this. They have to do some of their own testing and show what they found, uh, but I'm not privy to the toxicology. I don't, I don't read that literature. Yeah. Representative Floyd, you're recognized. Uh, Representative Floyd, you're recognized. Uh, I'm here. Okay. <coughs> In your region, how many states does it cover? That's a great question. I am in region four, so it's it's probably six to eight. Well, Mr. Chair. Yes, know. sir. And and you mentioned that all of them have this spectrometer. All of those states. I I don't know that all the states and all the regions have this. Most states and regions have something like what I have. Most of the states that I've been asked to work with have some mass spectrometry equipment, not necessarily exactly what I have. But, follow Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Unless I'm mistaken, I thought you said that all of them have. Unless I, I misunderstood. That, I assume that most of the labs that we work with with the states and with the regional labs have something like our triple quad. Um, it's it's getting to be the workhorse of the lab, so I, I imagine they have it, but I don't know offhand if everyone does. Follow, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Oh, I yield to Representative Dixon. Come back. Don't want to hold the questions. I yield. You've got the floor. <laughs> now, my concern is that and, uh, is that as the federal shrink, we're moving into something new within the region in which I you know, I, uh, I serve. And the question in my community is that they really want water, not bottled water, okay? So if we purchase this machine in which, you know, this committee with one of the recommendation coming from, from, coming from Dina that they expressed that they need. Mm -hmm. And I hear, hear you are saying that two things, one, we can utilize another institution and we don't need the Cadillac uh, uh, model. If, if you have an organization within the state that's willing to work with you and they have this equipment, yes, you can do that. I don't know who has this in the states that are within this region um, from an EPA perspective. Within our state, yes, we do have universities that have this. Um, and, and you using their equipment, you know, that's, that's not up to me. Follow up, Mr. Chen. Yes, sir. You know, as you mentioned in your line of work, your line of work would come first, be, uh, and, and talking with, uh, speaking with reference to McRock, is that your line of work will come, your, your workload will come first, and then whatever you can do for our great state will come second. Is that? The, I wouldn't say that because the work that I did for the state of North Carolina put everything I was doing okay. on hold on a national level for about six months. So, no, the answer is no, that didn't okay. happen. <laughs> Follow up, Michelle, last question. Yes, sir. It, it, uh, you know, it is always best for a child to have his own basketball if he can participate in the basketball game mm -hmm. in order to be a good player, you know, because he can practice that's a little bit longer. So, I, uh, you, you know, the machine in which the department requested is something that is vitally needed. And when I look at other institutions, I see them as looking at, sure, they will work with this great state, but I see them also as saying, my work, my study, my research come first, and if I can get a little time, mm -hmm. I give a little time to help address genetics. So, I just see this as a very important, you know, for our, you know, for our state. At least it had a smooth ride. I, I would agree with you. That's best case scenario. Representative Dixon, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stryker, for 
for the uh, manner in which you're responding. Your expertise is uh, vitally important uh, to, to this committee, and we thank you for, uh, uh, for expressing. I'd like to return to my original question that you alluded to just a moment ago about uh, the request to help North Carolina put everything else on hold. Did I understand you correct when I asked the question about what pointed you to North Carolina, what was the stimulus for it? Did, did you say that the manufacturing companies did not know exactly what they were doing and that the manufacturing companies wanted to know? No. What I said was that the company in the pre-manufacture notice has to inform my agency, here's what we intend to make. The analytical chemist, the environmental chemist of which I am at the bench level is not aware of that information because that's confidential business information. I'm not made privy to that under TSCA. I can get access to that, but there are legalities behind what I can and can't do with that. So to protect my own interests, I don't want to get access to that information. I want to use a mass spec to do the job I do. Follow up? So, so once again, uh, help me understand the exact stimulus that brought you to North Carolina and brought you to the Cape Fear River. So the exact stimulus is we published a paper in 2007 where we looked for legacy perfluorinated chemicals on the Cape Fear River, the Haw of the Deep, and from Moncure on down to Wilmington. What and, and what motivated that study? What motivated that study is I'm a methods developer. My job is to, with, for lack of a better term, use my crystal ball to sort of figure out what needs to be done next. And as I read the literature out there, perfluorinated chemicals were growing in use and they were growing with respect to where they were being found. And we asked the question, are they in our state? Are they in our watershed? So that's what started our original work back in 06, 07. Why we went to this location to look for Gen X and other related analytes is, I can look right up on the hill and see Comores or DuPont lives there. There's a sign that says industrial effluent. We noticed a spike at that time of related analytes, nothing about Gen X, nothing about PFOA. It was actually a compound called C7, one carbon less than PFOA. And we asked the question, why does that go up? And when we went back, is it still high it was? What else did we find in that sample? It's, you go and look at the source to see what compounds are being put out. That, that was the stimulus behind that. Thank you. Uh, one last follow-up for yes, DEQ, sir. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, this relates to the West Virginia situation again. My understanding is that uh, West Virginia ceased the processing of C8. They discontinued that because of the uh, situation in West Virginia. And then DEQ was involved in permitting them to do the C8 here in North Carolina. Is that anywhere close to accurate? Hi, Linda Culpepper, uh, again with Division Water Resources, and um, I will have to have someone, Dr., or excuse me, Representative Dixon, that was here in the water program at the time to be able to answer that question, because I do not know. Mr. Chairman, I think that's, uh, that's an exploratory question that would be uh, interesting uh, uh, to, to the committee. I am of the opinion that uh, we were well aware of the C8 situation in West Virginia and then the powers that existed at that time both in the executive and in the General Assembly and at uh, the former Diener uh, may not have paid as much attention to the C8 situation in West Virginia when we then allowed uh, that process uh, to be permitted here in North Carolina. And I would like that follow-up information and clarification on what uh, North Carolina Diener at that time knew about CA production in West Virginia and what, if any, effect that had on our decision to permit the C8 process in North Carolina. Ms. Culpepper, if I could ask you, would it be possible for you to share that request with those others at DEQ and, and be able to provide that information? Yes, sir, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I can maybe shed some light if you're willing. Yes, sir. 
We so, need all the brightness we can get. <laughs> so there was something called the C8 Stewardship Agreement. Okay, the C8 Stewardship Agreement was an agreement between the US EPA and eight major manufacturers in the United States that made PFOA to reduce the output of that compound PFOA by 95% by 2010 and by 100% in products by 2015. So that agreement was not binding, it was not legally binding, it was an agreement for EPA and the eight major manufacturers, Daikin, DuPont, Comores, 3M, et cetera, to stop making those compounds while they transitioned into the new compounds that were no longer C8. So it's not just West Virginia, it was actually on a national level and there was also lots of agreements on a global level from OECD, for example, to cease and desist the production of PFOA and things like it, things that degrade the PFOA. So there was this concerted effort on the national level to get away from PFOA and get to shorter chain homologs and compounds that appear not to bioaccumulate. So was, the, was the financial settlement in West Virginia $300 million? I think it was $670 million. We're talking about real money here over $600 million settlement, and uh, we then in North Carolina made the decision that, and I don't know when that settlement was reached, probably after the process was transferred to North Carolina. PFOA would have been at this location. It would have been made in Fayetteville years before that settlement. Um, what they did, PFOA is a production, a polymer processing aid used to make Teflon. Gen X is the replacement for PFOA. So DuPont or Comores, whoever they were at that time, would have been shipping the PFOA up to West Virginia to make the Teflon there, and they just swapped out PFOA for Gen X. So likely it was for many years before. One last, what if any effect, <clears throat> excuse me, what if any effect uh, does the, did the current uh, uh, executive order uh, doing away with suing and settling uh, that I know just a little bit about. Uh, if, if that had been in place, what effect would that have had on the $660 million settlement? You can I answer that if you know. I have no idea what you're talking about, so I'm not going to answer that question. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, it, it's, it's about money, and it's about uh, the lust to generate lawsuits and stuff like that, and that's the reason we've had a lot of sensationalism on Gen X, which we, have, which we still don't know what it is. Thank you. Chairman Ollie, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right behind you, Dr. Steiner. Thank you for being here. Um, and um, I appreciate your perspective being with the EPA. You've got a broad perspective nationally and so forth. And also, uh, we also talked about this being about water, not just about river water. So, and, and Representative Floyd brought up bottled water. What do we know? What does the EPA know, if you're aware? about the sources of our bottled water that everybody's running to buy at the box stores uh, and what kind of testing that goes through before these folks run to it as if it's the purest thing in the universe? That's a great question and my answer is gonna be I really have no idea um, if they know anything about the source of PFOA or Gen X in that source water. Um, what we do know is as part of the UCMR3, that's the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule 3, drinking water sources that supplied water to more than 10,000 people were assessed. I don't know that drinking water and bottled water has been assessed as part of that. It's, it's absolutely something that's critical to assess, but I, I don't know if anyone's done that yet. Follow, follow up? Yes, sir. And this is a serious question. I'm not trying to send us off into a different direction, but uh, what, 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 excuse me, what source could I go to to find out uh, what has been done? I have to go to the companies. If you can find them all, they've got different brand names in different parts of the country. But uh, you go to the companies. Is somebody at EPA in Washington or some national laboratory somewhere that can help me? If, if there's somebody that knows that answer, it's probably at the Office of Water. It's not me. I could get you a name of somebody who could maybe answer that question. Um, if, if that company is not being asked to measure for these compounds in their water because it's a non-regulated contaminant, my guess is it's not being monitored for in that bottled water. So if that source water had these contaminants, it's possible it's in the bottled water. But I, I don't know. Uh, can I quote you on that? 
you may not. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Seriously. If I could, I really have been trying to grab my head around all this talk about spectrometers. I know they're all different types of spectrometers. It's been said that there, these things are all over the University of North Carolina system, and we can use those to, to do this. I'm just, and I know Andy Miller from DEQ is going to come up in just a minute, but I'm just trying to get an understanding. And am I correct? And and Mr. Miller, I guess I'm. You chime in if I, if I'm saying anything you need to respond to before you come up. But what was asked for by DEQ? that the House voted on, that 500 and I think it was $37 million, but that just wasn't just for the spectrometer. That included people that work on it and um, uh, maintenance. But my point is, that is what's called a high-resolution tandem liquid chromatography mass spectrometer. Is that correct? So I, I think what they're asking for is an, a liquid chromatography quadrupole time-of-flight mass spec. So that's the one I sit in the middle of that Cadillac version. See, and that, that's the problem I'm having. I, I read all these things, and it says one thing. Then I read something else, and it says something else. And I really want to try to get my head around it. I'm sure this committee does, too. I, I want to make sure what was done in that House bill. My understanding when I stood up and argued on the floor and this House bill was passed is that DEQ was asking for a high-resolution tandem liquid chromatography mass speedometer. Is that correct or not? Uh, that is correct. I think uh, the so we, yet Mark Dr. Schreiner is correct and you are correct. Uh, we asked for five hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars for the mass spectrometer, which is a QTOF. Another way to say some of these broader terms, which is some of my lack of understanding and learning about mass spectrometers, is saying LCMSMS, calling it a tandem, is exactly the same as calling it an MSMS, but the QTOF is a tandem mass spectrometer. Okay. So that is what DEQ asked for. That is what was contained when the vote was taken in the House. That is correct. For House Bill 189. Okay. Now, I understand that there's a, a more sophisticated mass spectrometer that could be used, and that's what's called an Orbitrap. That's right. the Cadillac version, as I understand what you're the, saying. Tesla. Yeah. The Tesla. I'm sorry? That's the, the Tesla version. It's better than the QTOF. An Orbitrap is, is top of the line. Okay, that's fine. And that's... Is it my understanding that there are only two entities in the state that have an orbit trap, and that is Duke University and your EPA lab at the Research Triangle Park? So that's the orbit trap I have. Mm -hmm. Mine is called an orbit trap fusion. Dr. Ferguson's is called an orbit trap Loomis, and I don't want to. Okay, that's okay. They're very, very similar, but they're eight hundred and fifty to a million dollars. Yes, sir. Eight hundred fifty thousand to a million. There are other orbit traps, but they're not. They're not fusions, and I, I can't get into the details of how they differ. They're not exactly what I have. They're kind of an upper end of a QTOF, the lower end of an Orbi trap. So and there's, a, there's also additional cost with these. But if I understand what you have been saying, DEQ really doesn't need a Orbi trap because if they had the QTOF, then that would be sufficient for them to do the work that they want to do, and that is what they asked for. That would be my opinion because that's exactly what I used to do the work that I did for Discovery and for all the work I did for the state of North Carolina throughout the summer. Okay. Uh, I would ask you, um, do you, Mr. Miller, do you agree with that? I absolutely agree. I think an easy way for me to describe it is that uh, this is kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. We didn't ask for the Chevy. We didn't ask for the Tesla. We asked for the Cadillac. Okay. So... They asked for a Q top. That's what the House considered in their bill. You're saying in, that, in your opinion, that the Q top is sufficient for what DEQ wants to use it for, and they don't need this Cadillac orbit trap. <laughs> is that correct? It was my opinion that what they asked for is exactly what they need. Okay. Now, my next question is it has been said that there are spectrometers all throughout the university system that can be used to do what DEQ wants to do as far as having a mass spectrometer to look at Gen X and emerging compounds. And once again, that would be the QTOP. Is that 
Okay. To your knowledge, are there Q-top mass spectrometers that are equipped to do the analysis that DEQ wants to do throughout the University of North Carolina system? The short answer is I'm aware of some, but I really don't know exactly what is in the system, only from the professors that I've interacted with, some of which are those that spoke this morning from UNCW. I do know that UNC in Chapel Hill has some equipment that is, I don't know if it's a QTOF, but I do know they have some high resolution equipment. NC State, you know, I've talked to some of those professors and they have similar. So I, I can't tell you without a okay. doubt this is what is there and who has it, but I have seen some of this type of equipment at some of these universities, so they, they do exist. Let's say for sake of argument that the UNC system does not have a Q-top that's ready to roll, but they do have some spectrometers that, can you f upfit a, a, a lesser qualified mass spectrometer, if you will, to bring it up to the standard that it would be a Q-top? The answer to that question is no, you cannot. You you're, cannot? Sort, you're sort of stuck with the Chevy if you buy the Chevy. Okay, because I, I had been told that if, and that's why I asked the question that, okay, well, maybe if a, a school had a mass spectrometer, and though it was not of the quality that you really needed, it could be upgraded. But as I understand what you're saying, that is yeah. not. If you buy a triple quad, an MSMS, those are the same thing. You can mm -hmm. never do high resolution work. You cannot upgrade it to do high resolution work. If you buy a QTOF, a TOF, an Orbi, which are all high resolution, they can't be upgraded any further either. You're stuck with what it is you purchase at that time. Okay, thank you. And I understand too that DEQ at the present time is sending their samples for analysis to the EPA lab in Georgia. And it's about a five week turnaround period to get the results back. Is, is that, as I understand it, your lab in, in the research triangle part is a research laboratory to develop test methods and that your facility is not available for long-term monitoring, which is what DEQ wants. Is, is, that, is that not why they're having to ship things out to Georgia rather than doing it right here in the Triangle? That's a safe assessment. I'm a research lab. I'm not a contract lab. We do do that to some degree in the support we did, but our regional labs are there to do long-term monitoring for the states and the regions, and that's why those samples are now being shipped there. Why it takes five weeks versus three weeks is anyone's guess. I would say we're very good at what we did, and we could turn it around rapidly because we have been doing it for a while, but there are quality assurance and quality control measures that need to be met, and no good lab is going to give you data before they're ready to give you that data, and they can stand behind it in court, and that's what the regional labs have to do. As a research lab, I didn't have to have the potential to stand in front of a court and argue for my data. I needed to give an answer to the EQ as quick as I could, and I had to say, this is how confident I am in this data, and we did it as rapidly as we could. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments by the committee? Representative Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your presentation. I appreciate your patience with us. I, um, I wanted to respond to the comment about the health concerns. I, um, it would be my preference if we could exercise a precautionary principle and if we didn't know whether something had a health impact that we not allow it in our water or our air or our food or our cosmetics or our clothes or furniture. So that just that's my editorial comment. Um, my question, though, is uh, along Representative McElrath's um, questions about the staffing needs. Um, is there, there's a difference between staffing needs for targeted versus non-targeted chemicals, right? I wouldn't say that's true. I think I've, I've met with the chemist at DEQ, Chris Johnson in particular. Absolutely, Chris has the capacity to do this job with some instruction as to how we've been doing it and helping with technology transfer. I, again, I don't think this is something you require somebody who's you know, got a PhD in chemistry. It's not needed. You need somebody, again, who's dedicated and has the ability to learn with what you tell them and has a demonstrated capacity to follow those instructions and on a, on a daily basis show that the method works. And, and if I could comment on the precautionary principle, I would agree with you. And as legislators, uh, I think we need to move in that direction. Chairman Grange, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a comment, and it's not really directed to you, Dr. Steiner. Um, I, would, there's been discussion this afternoon about what UNC's capabilities are with respect to spectrometers, and I don't think it's we don't, I've listened to 
listened to a very extensive presentation in a Senate committee two weeks ago um, regarding what their capabilities were, and I just don't think it's fair that we don't have them here talking about their capabilities and rather than we are speaking on their behalf. If I may interject, I don't think he's speaking on their behalf. I, 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 if I may, I'm asking, I ask his opinion. If you would like to suggest that we have somebody from them to come over, well, I'd be I more think than that happy. would be the proper thing to do. And I, and I, I'm not, I did not direct my comment towards you, Dr. Stringer. I think Dr. Ferguson has been here to speak to you. He may give you a different opinion on to whether or not you need an Orby trap or a QTOF. Um, but we're fishing buddies and we've talked about this. And sometimes we have differing opinions. Certainly. <laughs> That's what makes the world go round. Is there any other member of the committee that has Mr. any Chair. question or comments? Representative Dixon, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I got to pick on my friend, Representative Harrison, just a little bit based on her based on her wishes, should we start with sugar, grease, and alcohol? Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand the relevancy of that. Yeah. Um, Representative Floyd, you're recognized. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, at, the conclusion, at the conclusion of the day, I, I see us as having our own basket, I mean, you know, Dina having this own basketball because it's hard to play with a borrowed basketball and then have the, have the, uh, the staff and the expertise to win the game. So i just like for us to keep what the uh, 537, uh, the urgent it is, Cadillac, uh, I think. I guess he has, in his presentation, he has a Chevy, Cadillac, and I guess it's a Tesla. Yeah. We need our own in order to move forward so that we can have a rapid response, uh, you know, in the state as we look at these uh, uh, emergency contaminants, you know, throughout the state. So I just wish that we keep that in some kind of way, don't back away from Dina's recommendation. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Representative McElroy? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, is the EPA doing anything on pharmaceuticals? For instance, birth control that gets into the water system, uh, people throw away pharmaceuticals down the toilet that gets into the water system, and a lot of it cannot be filtered out. Um, and they're showing girls going into puberty earlier, and they're thinking possibly that could be it. Is there any research is being done on that because it's kind of with the water quality thing that kind of fits right in and I just wondered is anyone addressing those kind of things? The answer is yes there's a lot of work going on on many analytes heavy metals pharmaceuticals personal care products industrial contaminants um, it's not just perfluorinated compounds so there is active research going on there's an endocrine disruptors program absolutely I agree with you all the products that we use in our home that eventually get flushed down the toilet and make it into the wastewater treatment plant become the source water for somebody. And all of those are vitally important. It's, again, I agree with you, there's a, there's a mixture, there's a large mixture of analytes and, and those are some of them uh, that are being looked at. 